Amen. As you're grabbing your seats, go ahead and get your Bibles and your notes and open them to 1 Timothy chapter 6. 1 Timothy chapter 6 this morning, we are going to start in verse 3 of 1 Timothy chapter 6, and we're going to work through verse 10. And um, as you know, Paul is addressing many different subjects and topics in regards to the church. Uh, we established in the very first week of this sermon series that he writes 1 Timothy so that Timothy himself and the congregation would know how to conduct themselves in the household of God. And so he, he talks about church and, and that church should be about family. And he talks about the things that the church should do and the things that the church should have knowledge of. And, and today he's going to remind us once again about something that the church should be uh, really kind of guarded against and prepared to address. And he's going to talk about false teachers and this is not the first time that Paul has addressed false teaching in 1 Timothy. It's actually come up as a recurring theme. If you remember back in chapter 1, he addresses false teaching. And then early on in chapter 4, he addresses false teachers. And now that we get to chapter 6, verse 3, he's going to bring false teachers up again. And I believe it's Paul's heart to address this because, first off, he knows that it's a reality, that false teachers have infiltrated this church in Ephesus, that they are out teaching things that they shouldn't, and they're causing a lot of problems. In fact, he would say that they are causing a lot of destruction, and the reason why they cause a lot of destruction is because of the things that they do, the things that they produce, and the things that they're motivated by, and they often go undetected for long seasons of time. Right, And so Paul's going to address that this morning. He's going to give us some ideas on how we might be able to identify those who are not true believers, who are false teachers within God's congregation or the household of faith. And so that's what we see here. Paul is going to share with Timothy in, in chapter 6 again that false teachers are present and he wants us to know what they look like so that we might be able to address them so that they are not as destructive as they could be. You know, we, we see false teachers infiltrate the church. They're really kind of in the first century here and even today, basically kind of like spiritual Trojan horses. Anybody in here know what the Trojan horse is by a show of hands? All right, so a good number of, of people in the room. Those of you that may not be as familiar with it in literature, Trojan horse uh, was a gift given by the Greeks to the city of Troy, right? And this is how the story goes. After many, many years of trying to lay siege to this city and being unsuccessful, the Greeks come up with a plan that they would give this gift, this Trojan horse, this, this gigantic horse made out of, of wood to uh, the city of Troy as a gift, right? And within this horse were hidden men. And so the idea was that they would give this gift and pretend to sail away. And then when the gift was brought within the city walls, the men in side would come out under the cover of darkness, open up the front gates, and let the Greeks back in. And so that's exactly what they did. They gave this gift. They uh, set sail during the daytime hours, right, to, to give the idea that they were on their way um, out. And in the cover of darkness, the men come out of the Trojan horse. They unlock the front gates. And all of those ships that had sailed off in the daytime had actually come back reverted course, and under the cover of darkness, they infiltrate the city. And so, sp spiritual speaking, false teachers are, are kind of the same. They're like spiritual Trojan horses. And in terms of today, we know that a Trojan horse is something that is a trick or strategy that would cause people to invite an enemy into what is supposed to be a protected place, right? And if that happens, lots and lots of bad things can result from that, right? And so, so that's the idea here is that they're like a spiritual Trojan horse. They've infiltrated this early church and they are there not to help the church grow and to focus on the things of God, but to establish things for themselves. In fact, Jesus would say it this way in the gospel of Matthew. In Matthew chapter seven, verse 15, Jesus would, would say, beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves, all right? And so that's the, that's the picture you see there, that false teachers would infiltrate the, the local church by looking the part, right? They, they look like a sheep. They sound like a sheep, but make no mistake about it, they are not a sheep. 
They are a wolf and they are bent on destruction. The enemy is using them to come against God's people. Jesus in Matthew chapter 24 tells us that in the latter days, false teachers will arise, many will arise, and lead many astray. And so this is a significant topic for us to look into this morning. We need to be able to identify those that are not true believers. We need to be able to identify those that would be considered false teachers. And Paul is going to give us three of those ways this morning in this text as we study it together. And so if you would read with me this morning, 1 Timothy chapter 6, starting in verse 3. I'm going to read this together, then I'll pray, then we'll look at the three ways that we can identify false teachers in our midst. Verse 3, if anyone teaches a different doctrine and does not agree with the sound words of our Lord Jesus Christ and the teaching that accords with godliness, he's puffed up with conceit and understands nothing. He's an unhealthy, he has an unhealthy craving for controversy, for quarrels about words which produce envy, dissension, slander, evil suspicions, and constant friction among people who are depraved in mind and deprived of the truth, imagining that godliness is a means of gain. But godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into the world and we cannot take anything out of the world. But if we have food and clothing, with these we will be content. But those who desire to be rich fall into temptation, into a snare, into many senseless and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evils. It's through this craving that some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many pangs. Let's pray together this morning. Father, we come before you and we ask that you would guide our time together in your word. God, I pray that you would give us discernment. God, I pray that you would give us understanding. God, I pray very specifically for us this morning as we look at these verses in chapter six, God, that you would help us to understand and have the tools necessary to be able to identify those that would be considered false teachers. And God, I pray that you would give us wisdom and discernment, God, so that we might not be led astray. And God, I pray that you would give us boldness so that we might protect others from being led astray by those who are not true believers. But God, they are wolves in sheep's clothing. And so God, I pray this morning that you would guide our time. God, I pray that you would help us to apply this rightly to our lives. And we pray all this in Jesus' name, amen. All right, as I said at the beginning this morning, we're gonna look at three different things in this passage of scripture that Paul gives to Timothy and this congregation in Ephesus uh, so that they might be able to identify those that are false teachers in their midst. So we're gonna look at three things that we can use to identify false teachers this morning. Number one, the very first thing that's addressed in this text is this, that false teachers are exposed by their actions, False teachers are exposed by their actions. You've probably all in the room heard the saying, actions speak louder than words, right? And so that's the idea here. Paul is saying that if you want to know if somebody is true or false, look at what they do. They're going to look an awful lot like the sheep, back to the analogy that Jesus used, they're gonna look an awful lot like the sheep, right? And on the outside, there's gonna be a facade, there's gonna be an appearance that they belong. They're also gonna probably talk like one of the sheep, right? And so the, what they look like and the things they say, they're, they're gonna be right on track, right? But the, the piece that they're gonna be missing is what they do. And we know that to be true, that actions do speak louder than words. So if you want to be able to identify somebody that is a false teacher, don't look at what their appearance is like. Don't look at what they say they believe. Look at what they do. Look at what they do because their actions are going to expose them, right? We know this to be true. A wolf in sheep's clothing uh, makes sense for a while, but eventually what's going to happen is a wolf is going to act like a wolf, right? You might be able to pretend to be a sheep for a season of time, but eventually you are going to be exposed because wolves act like wolves and sheep act like sheep. And that's what Paul is reminding them. They will be exposed through their actions. And so he lists a couple things in this passage of scripture. We see this in verse three and verse four A, all right? So let's go back and, and re-examine this a little bit. So what does Paul say that they are going to do? 
right? Look at this list. He says, if anyone teaches different doctrine and does not agree with the sound words of our Lord Jesus Christ and the teaching that accords with godliness, he's puffed up with conceit and understands nothing. He has an unhealthy craving for controversy and for quarrels about words. So what are they going to do? Well, you're going to be able to observe some actions here. They're not going to be doctrinally sound, number one. Number two, they are going to eventually expose themselves as ungodly, right? Not people of godliness, but ungodliness. They are conceited, right? If you want to to look and see their actions, they're going to be conceited. This is going to be a person of, of arrogance. They're going to lack real understanding. And I believe he's talking here about biblical understanding, the things of God. And we know that they're going to lack that because the scriptures tell us that you only know that because of the Spirit. Right, So if they're lacking the Holy Spirit, they're going to lack understanding and knowledge of the things of God. The next one it talks about is craves controversy. I love that he uses this word because this isn't, this isn't a one-off. Right, What he's going to describe here is a pattern of behavior that is observable. Their actions over time are going to demonstrate that they love this. Right? This isn't just something that they, that they did one time or they accidentally kind of stumbled into or they, they caused a little bit of disunity that, that one year or that, that one issue. No, this is a pattern of behavior. And we know that because Paul uses the word craves. Check that out. They crave controversy. They crave being quarrelsome. They crave causing dissension. They crave causing disloyalty or disunity. Right, And so we see this in their actions. So the number one thing that Paul reminds us of here is if we're going to identify false teachers, we need to look at what they do, not what they say in their outward appearance. Because it's easy to fool people for a season. But again, over time, you're going to be able to observe who these people are and their actions will speak louder than their words. So a couple of, of practical things here. Remember, number one, that you're looking for consistency in behavior, right? We know that this side of heaven, no one is perfect. No one is completely sinless. We're all at some point probably going to be involved in something that we shouldn't be. We're going to say something that we shouldn't say. We're going we're to risk causing something to, to turn quarrelsome or to maybe even cause some disunity, but we're not talking again about the one-off example. We're looking for somebody who has a consistent pattern of behavior in these areas, and we would not look at them and say that that's what God has called us to, to be. Number two, trust your eyes over words. Trust your eyes over words. If you're trying to identify a sheep, versus a wolf, you need to be able to trust your eyes in this situation. Again, remember, you're trying to observe actions, right? So, so trust your eyes over words. You may have heard it said that if someone shows you who they really are, believe them. That's absolutely applicable to this passage as well. They might look the part. They might dress the way that they're supposed to dress. They might attend the things that they're supposed to attend. They may be walking around with a Bible in their hand a lot. They may pray. They may even occasionally read God's word. They, they may look the part, but you're going to be able to observe that their actions don't match up with what they're saying. And so the very first thing that Paul says here in order to identify false teachers is you're to look at their actions. They will be exposed by what they do. All right, by what they do. Number two in this passage False teachers produce unhealthy fruit. They produce unhealthy fruit. We see this in verses 4b and, and verse 5. Let's revisit it together real fast. He says, which produce, so these actions that we just talked about, those actions, they produce some things. And Paul's going to describe them here. We're going to recognize that they're not healthy fruit. They're unhealthy fruit. Their actions produce envy, dissension, slander, evil suspicions, constant friction among people who are depraved in mind and deprived of the truth, imagining that godliness is a means of gain. So he's saying they can't help but act a certain way. Like we just described, you can look like a sheep all day long, but a wolf is going to act like a wolf. And at some point when they do those things, 
and they live out those actions, they are going to produce in their life something And what they're going to produce is unhealthy fruit. Listen, every single person is going to produce some kind of fruit in your life. It's either going to be healthy or unhealthy fruit. And he's saying here that if you're a false teacher, you'll be able to identify them based upon what their life is producing. It's not producing the fruit of the Spirit. We'll get that to here in just a second. But what they're producing are these other things. They're producing envy and dissension, and slander, evil suspicions, constant friction. And remember, this is a pattern of behavior. It's an observable pattern. This isn't a one-off event. These are people that these things follow them everywhere they go. You know somebody like that? That's, that's a way to identify them as a wolf in, in sheep's clothing. That Everywhere they go, envy follows. That disunity follows. That slander follows. And as we're going to see, that's just the opposite of what Jesus describes here in Matthew chapter 7. He says in Matthew 7, verse 16 through 20, that you will recognize them by their fruits. Are grapes gathered from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? So every healthy tree bears good fruit, but the diseased tree bears bad fruit. So Jesus, he goes all in this too. In the same exact chapter, right after he talked about wolves and sheep clothing, what they do and their actions, Jesus himself says, you'll be able to observe what they produce as well. And listen, he says, I'm here to tell you that good trees do not produce bad fruit and bad unhealthy trees do not produce good fruit. Our next door neighbor has like a thousand fruit trees in his backyard. I mean, it covers like the whole thing. Maybe that's a little bit of an exaggeration, but there are many fruit trees in his backyard, right? There's uh, several apple trees. There's a cherry tree. There's a persimmon tree. There's uh, a peach tree that one year was so beautiful, so healthy. It produced so much fruit that the branches were breaking from the weight of all this amazing fruit. But, but there's another tree in there that he has that it's an apple tree and it was planted, he told us, at the exact same time as the, the apple tree right next to it. And one of them is great big. It's enormous, right? And every single year it produces apples and this other one, it's just little bitty. And, and we asked him, why is that one so small if they were planted together? And he said it just didn't get the same level of sunlight. Therefore, the tree itself never grew. And so it's an unhealthy tree. And you know what is also true of that tree? It never produces fruit. It's just a tiny little scrubby tree. And the tree right next to it is a healthy, vibrant tree. And you know what it does? It produces fruit. That's exactly what Jesus said. You can observe what they produce in their lives. And you're going to produce What you sow, right? You'll reap what you sow. If their actions are ungodliness and all of these ugly things, then they're going to produce unhealthy fruit. But if they're going to live as Christ would call us to live through the work of the Holy Spirit in their lives, they're going to produce healthy fruit. And so we see this in the text that false teachers produce unhealthy fruit. So a good question for us to ask is what kind of fruit is coming out of this person's life? Are they producing envy, dissension, slander, evil suspicions, friction, and disunity? And are those things following them everywhere they go? Or are they described, as Galatians would describe you, as fruit of the Spirit? Galatians chapter 5, verse 22 and 23. And it's fruit, not fruits. Fruit of the Spirit Right? And remember, Jesus' analogy of healthy fruit, he said, in Christ, you can't help but bear good fruit. That's why it's fruit of the Spirit. Like These are things that naturally occur in the believer's life because of the presence of the Holy Spirit and the transformation that God has put them through. And here's what you would produce in Christ. You would produce love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things, there is no law. So he's saying that the second way to be able to identify the wolves among the sheep is look at what they produce. They can't fake what they produce. An unhealthy tree cannot bear good fruit, and a good tree cannot bear 
bad fruit. They're either going to be producing the fruit of the Spirit or they're going to be producing this other list of things that Paul provides for us here in this text. Number three, the third thing, the third thing in identifying false teachers is this. False teachers are motivated by selfish gain. They're motivated by selfish gain. We see this in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 5, B, the second half there. He says, imagining that godliness is a means of gain. And what's happening here in the early church in Ephesus is because of the congregation's support of the people, there is, there is some sort of, of financial support here, right? And so he's saying that the false teachers, the false prophets in their midst, they're viewing it as an opportunity to gain for themselves, right? So, so they're, they're wanting to be a part of the church, not for discipleship, not for pouring themselves out on behalf of others. They're wanting to be a part of this ministry here in Ephesus so that they might gain financially, that they might gain personally. So remember, they're motivated by selfish gains. He's saying, imagining that godliness is some means of gain. First Timothy chapter six, verse nine, at the first part there, he says, but those who desire to be rich fall into temptation. So again, he's reminding us here, when we talk about false teachers, we can look at their underlying motivation, right? What, what is it that makes them wake up in the morning? Is it a desire to know Christ more? Is it a desire to make disciples? Is it a desire to pour themselves out on behalf of the congregation to, to actually shepherd them? Or is their desire rooted in selfish gain? And this is important for us. We know that we still see this today. It's all around us. I'm quite confident that even this morning you could turn on a television set and probably find a false teacher. You could go to YouTube and queue up a video of somebody teaching on something that I almost guarantee you is a false teacher. They're not really in it to love other people and to sacrifice for other people. They're in it for selfish gain. They don't care about the people that they say that they care about. They want to prey upon those people. So let me give you a real easy test and a red flag for you to be able to use, right? Being promised anything for financial contribution that's a false teacher, right? Real simple. Like you, you sow a seed into this ministry, you know what you'll get? Nothing. You're going to be led to destruction because that's a false teacher. That's somebody that's in it for selfish gain. If you would just give a little money to our ministry, we'll send you a prayer rug. You just give us a little bit of money, we'll send you some, some water that we've, that's holy water or something. You, you give us a little money, you know what God's going to do? He's going to give you 10 times that in your bank account tomorrow morning. Those are all ungodly, untruthful things that are spread around by false teachers. So if you're, if you're curious, look at what their core motivation is. As you observe and as you think through things, and you watch and you listen, you should be able to pick up on some things. Like, listen, they don't do what they say, and what they produce is not godliness, but ungodliness. And, and what motivates them has nothing to do with the people, the people that they're supposed to be ministering to. So interesting this week, I'm in preparation for this, and I come across a video on Twitter, and it's a lady who is healing some guy and, and, and his son, and I don't know what's going on, but she's praying over him, and nothing, none of it's godly, right? And the thing that struck me was not so much what she was doing because it was crazy, Right? You, you would think with a little bit of discernment and, the, and a, just a little bit of the Holy Spirit, you'd have walked in there and go, oh, nope, this is wild. All right, we're, we're out, right? What struck me, though, was not what she was doing and not what she was saying, but that there was more people in that room than we've ever had in here. I mean, packed, shoulder-to-shoulder -shoulder people. Why? Because they're drawing crowds. They're not focused on God's word and the people. They're, they're focused on selfish gain. It's just about getting the people there. Why? So that they can prey upon them, so that they can take advantage of them. They, they've made this so personal. In contrast, Paul would say this in Philippians chapter 1, verse 21 and 22. For to me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. If I'm to live in the flesh, that means fruitful labor for me, yet which I shall choose, I cannot tell. 
See how those are two different things? One's motivated by selfish gain. Paul's greatest motivation was to know Jesus Christ. It's what he got up in the morning for. That's why he went on all the missionary journeys that he went on. And his second greatest motivation, I want to make sure that we don't miss it. In verse 22, what does it say? Fruitful labor. Not fruitful for himself, fruitful for the kingdom. Paul's greatest motivation is to know Jesus Christ and be a part of his work so that other people might come to saving faith, so that other people might be discipled. We see that that sits in stark contrast to what was happening here with the false teachers in the midst of the church in Ephesus. So Paul's saying, number three, if you want to be able to identify them, look at what their core motivation is. A false teacher is going to be motivated by things that are not godly. They're going to be motivated by selfish gain. They're going to be motivated by the things of this world. You know, in 1 John, he addresses that. John writes in 1 John that if you are going to be friends of the world, then you're going to be enemies with God. You can't chase after the things of the world and be about the things of God. The two things don't, don't go together. So a couple things for us to be thoughtful of and mindful of as we think through these things and try to evaluate and identify those that may not be truly in the, in the faith. Number one, is their greatest motivation knowing Jesus? When you think of that person, is their greatest motivation knowing Jesus? Is their greatest motivation fruitful ministry? Is this a person that leads you to a deeper relationship with Christ? Or is this just a person who makes you a bunch of empty promises that the Bible never makes you? Is this person a person that pours themselves out on behalf of others? It's the one thing that a false teacher can't be when they're all about themselves, when they're all about selfish gain. They cannot be about other people. So we're asking ourselves these questions. Are these things that we can observe? And so Paul Paul very eloquently challenges us with this in regards to false teachers. You'll be able to identify them by what they do. You'll be able to identify them by what they produce. And you're gonna be able to identify them by what their key motivation is in their life. I think the most heartbreaking part of this entire thing is knowing that Paul writes here that they are driven away from the faith. Their pursuit of worldly things their pursuit of riches that this life has to offer instead of Christ is plunging them to destruction, 1 Timothy says. It plunges them to destruction. And probably what's even worse than all of that is that they're leading people astray. They're taking other people with them because that's what they believe and it's because that's what they teach. They're leading other people astray as well. They're leading them away from the faith. They're plunging them into destruction. And ultimately, we know that they are led away from eternal life with God himself. Jesus addresses this too in Luke. And he warns us. He says, listen, the temptation of the world, the temptation of riches, the temptation of things that this life has to offer, it's gonna be easy to pull you away. It's gonna be easy to distract you from the things that, that God God wants you to be focused on like eternal life and, and, and eternal things. We see this in Luke chapter 12, verse 16 through 21. It says, and Jesus told them a parable saying, the land of a rich man produced plentifully. And he thought to himself, what shall I do? For I have nowhere to store my crops. And he said, I will do this. I'll tear down my barns and build larger ones. And there I will store all my grain and my goods. And I will say to my soul, soul, you have ample goods laid up for many years. Relax, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, you fool, this night your soul is required of you. And the things you have prepared, whose will they be? Listen, that's a good reminder to us that it is not worth it. It is not worth the pursuit of the things that this life has to offer and forsake the things that God has to offer because you will be plunged to destruction. You will wander away from the faith and you will be eternally separated from God because you went after the wrong things. And Jesus reminds us, what does it matter if you have all the stuff? Your soul is required of you. One day you will stand before God Almighty 
the creator of the universe. And you will be, you will either stand before him in judgment because you have fallen short, the Bible tells us, or you will be offered eternal life and entered into his presence because of the finished work of Jesus Christ. And so he's saying, like, listen, don't, don't, don't let the things of this world, don't let the pursuits, don't let the riches, don't let the stuff lead you away from what's most important. What's most important is that you have a relationship with Jesus Christ, that you're about the eternal things and not the temporal things. And that's what leads the false teachers in us away. It's what leads them away today. They're far too concerned about what they can get now, and they have no concern about eternal things. And that's what the most heartbreaking part of this entire passage is because if you remember 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 3 and 4, we already established that God's heart was for all people to come to saving faith. It says, this is good and it's pleasing in the sight of God our Savior who desires all people to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. God's desire is for you to, to have a relationship with him. God's desire is for you to experience forgiveness of sins. God's desire for you is not to experience eternal judgment. And so that's why I would offer this to you this morning. If you do not have a relationship with Jesus Christ, forsake the things of this world and pursue after Christ. The Bible tells us that if you would repent of your sins and believe, you'll have eternal life. And that's the offer this morning is that you too could know Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, that you could be about the right things, you could be about the eternal things and not be led astray by those who are really just wolves in sheep's clothing. Let's pray together this morning. Father, we thank you, God, for your word. God, we thank you for the challenge that we find in it. God, we thank you for the just the wisdom that we find in it. God, we thank you for the description that Paul lays out for us here in this text. God, as he describes those that are not truly a part of the faith. They don't truly care about other people, God. They care about themselves. They care about the things of this world. And God, I pray that, that you would help us to be able to identify them so that we are not personally led astray. God, and I pray that you would give us boldness to defend against those who would seek to lead people astray, God. Lord, I pray this morning for every single person in this room. God, I pray that they would all have a personal relationship with you. God, I pray that there's been a time that they've come to saving faith, God, that they've repented of their sins and they've given their lives to you. God, if not, I pray that you bring them to the end of themselves this morning. God, I pray that they would recognize that they're a sinner and their only hope for salvation is you, Jesus Christ. So, Father, we... We pray that you would be with this time of response, God. Fill people with boldness. Lead them to respond in whatever way you're you're calling them to respond. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen.